Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh to all the students and good morning everyone. So welcome to this first online webinar collaborating the students from UITM Segamat Campus and UITM Bandaraya Melaka Campus. This sessions will be a lecture on free consent which is one of the most complex, difficult and important topic under the elements of the formation of a valid contract. It is my honor to introduce our guest lecturer for this session that is Dr. Nasri Niza Hilmi Nasrijal, currently a senior lecturer of law department of UITM Campus Bandaraya Melaka. She has been teaching in UITM Melaka for more than 20 years. Besides, she also wrote many articles in some journals and uh, did several research uh, papers under certain grants. Okay, so before joining UITM, she was a lawyer, practiced in several legal firms in Kuala Lumpur and Malacca for a couple of years. So that's uh, without further delay, Dr. Nasrin, the microphone is yours. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning. Thank you very much, Madam Zura Maznum. Welcome to all students from UITM Chawangan Melaka, Campus Bandaraya Melaka, as well as those from um, UITM Johor Campus Segamat. All right, so um, today I'm going to explain to you regarding uh, free consent. I do agree with Madam Zura when she said that free consent is an important element um, but rather a bit complex yeah, because um, you need to be able to understand um, what is free consent and how it affects the contract. Uh, sometimes um, it can be a little bit confusing, uh, but I hope that with a little bit of um, sharing today, you might you would be able to distinguish um, between those things, um, what are the things that would um, cause consent not to be freely given. Okay, free consent. Yeah. Um, as Madam Zura has said just now, free consent is one of the elements in order to form a contract. This is one of the um, <clears throat> final element in order to form a valid contract. So basically what I intend to do today is that I intend to explain to you what is free consent all right, and how um, it is relevant as an element of contract. And um, I will also explain to you how uh, free what are, what are the things that would affect free consent and then i will show you how to examine yeah um to to basically how to apply the law yeah regarding questions on free consent okay now first of all free consent is a very important element in the contract where um, if you see, if you look at section 10, yeah, section 10 is a very important section. I've told my students that section 10 is very important section that you need to use it for um, consideration, for capacity, as well as free consent. Because from section 10, it says that in order for an agreement to become a valid contract, now these three elements must be present. There must be free consent of the parties who are competent. Competent here refers to capacity as well as there must be a lawful consideration. So an agreement would just be a, a, another agreement, yeah, uh, if it is not, if it, if, it does, if it doesn't contain these three elements. So you have to remember that not all agreements are contract. Um, some agreements may not have the uh, legal effect, uh, but in order to have a legal effect, agreement must be um, must be supported with these three elements. There must be capacity of the parties contracting and there must be um, lawful consideration as well as free consent. So what is the meaning of free consent? First of all, you have to look at what is the meaning of consent. Uh, now, I always tell my students, make sure that you pronounce the word correctly because when you pronounce the word correctly, then you will spell the word correctly. It's consent not concern yeah some students um uh, tend to uh, mix up yeah? the, these two words it's not concern but rather consent now what is the meaning of consent now section 13 of the contracts act explains what is consent it says that consent is when two or more people agree to the same thing in the same sense so you've got to agree on 
the same um, aspect. You've got to have a meeting of the minds between the contracting parties. You cannot have someone thinking of something and another person thinking of another thing. So it's got to be the meeting of the minds of them of the contracting parties. So you've got to agree whatever that you have agreed in the contract, it has to be on the same wavelength. Yeah? And in order for the consent to be free, and when we say free consent, um, bukan free to bukan percuma, eh? free to maksudnya, it is not affected by these five things. All right? These five things should not be present um, when you are giving consent. When you're agreeing to a contract, these five things should not be present. Coercion, undue influence, fraud, misrepresentation, and mistake. All right, so I'm going to go through one by one what it all means. Now, remember, these five things, bukan element, ya, bukan ingredient, ya, tapi dia adalah benda yang affect free consent. So when you agree to enter into a contract because of these five things, then your consent is not freely given so you've got to give your consent willingly freely yeah so free consent here refers to um that you agree to something willingly without any form of pressure without any form of influence or without any form of these five things and that causes the consent not to be freely given so first thing coercion what is the meaning of coercion now coercion <clears throat> is defined under section 15 now if you notice yeah the sections are arranged in such a nice way. Yeah, you've got section 13, which explains what is consent, section 14, which explains what is free consent, and then we've, you've got section 15, coercion, and then shortly we will see section 16, undue influence, section 17, fraud, section 18, misrepresentation, and then section 19 and 20 are the effects, and then section 21 is mistake. So what is coercion? So coercion under section 15, it says that when someone commits or threat, threatens to commit, yeah, he is doing something or he, he is threatening to do something which is forbidden penal code. Now, what is the penal code? Penal code is an act of parliament which has all the um, crimes, yeah, um, which cannot be, which are prohibited which, uh, in Malaysia, which cannot be committed in Malaysia. In Malay, penal code is known as kanun keseksaan. Ya, kanun keseksaan ni satu akta yang menyenaraikan semua jenis jenayah. So if someone, if someone threatens to do something which is forbidden by the penal code, you cannot do it under the penal code, ni, ni adalah satu bentuk jenayah. So kalau dia threaten, dia ugut nak buat ataupun dia buat benda tu so that the other person enters into an agreement, Ah, that is coercion, All right? Now, case on point is Kanaya Lal against National Bank of India. Um, what happened in this case is that the court decided that, yeah, the when you say there is coercion, this is an unlawful act. You're doing something which is unlawful with the intention to make the other person enter into the agreement. So what kind of actions are forbidden by the penal code? Now, these are some of the examples under the penal code. In fact, under the penal code, there are about 300 over, um, I think 400 over um, um, offences. Yeah? So if, let's say, for example, Ali. Yeah, Ali wants to enter into a contract with Abu. Ali, <clears throat> he wants to buy Abu's um, house so or, or shop. Yeah? So if he says, okay, if you don't, sell the shop to me, all right, I'm going to burn it down, ah, all right? So if he says that he's going to burn down uh, another person's property, that is an arson. Arson it basically is a form of a crime under the penal code. Or if he says that, yeah, you don't do this, I'm going to hit you or I'm going to um, um, harm your family members, all right? So um, causing assault, yeah, um, causing injury to another person, causing grievous hurt to another person is another example of um, uh, an act which is forbidden under the penal code. It's a crime, all right? So if he says, I'm going to kidnap your son if you don't do what I ask you to do and, and, and sign the contract. So that is also a form of uh, an act which is forbidden by the penal code. Huh? Kidnapping is an offense. Yeah. Or if he says, if he asks 
um, Ali asks Abu to sign a contract and Abu does not want and he steals things from Abu. That is also a form of uh, an act which is forbidden by the penal code. Or if he blackmails yeah, Abu, he says that if you don't sign a contract, I'm going to post yeah, um, um, images of you, uh, pictures of you uh, doing um, certain things, all right? Uh, on the social media or something like that. So that is a form of um, acts which are forbidden by the penal code. All right, now there are two cases to illustrate what is meant by coercion. Now we have the case of Kasal Mal, son of Lachmandas against Balia Pachatia. Now what happened in this case is that the um, is, this case was during the Japanese occupation of Malaya, all right? <clears throat> Excuse me, very old case, yeah? way before we gain our independence. So what happened was that um, this person was asked to transfer certain property. Remember during the Japanese, I'm sure uh, you've read uh, stories or you've heard stories uh, of the, the Japanese occupation whereby yeah, they, um, they uh, seized the property belonging to the people. Yeah? So what happened was that he was asked, yeah, the property owner was asked to surrender his property yeah um to the authorities yeah with two japanese army um standing by yeah, uh, making sure that he signed the contract so that is a form of coercion even though they did not say anything their presence itself was um enough to give fear in the mind of the person signing the the contract yeah so that is a form of coercion um similarly in the case of chinambi developments near Berhad, now this is where um Coercion is being made by way of extorting extra money. Yeah, this was a contract for the purpose of uh, purchasing a property, but the developer, and after the um, buyer had already paid deposits and all that, the developer uh, forced them to um, pay extra. Uh, that's a form of extortion of money. Yeah, uh, even though it was already agreed what was the purchase price and so on. Yeah, so they say that if you don't pay extra, then we will cancel the whole thing. So and that's a form of co coercion. Yeah? So what is the effect of coercion? Yeah, what happens if someone um, commits coercion? Now, basically, the effect of coercion is that the contract is voidable. Now, you've got to understand the meaning of voidable. Now, it is not void. It is voidable. Void, able. Able to be void. Okay, so what does it mean? So basically, what it means is that this contract, well, you can proceed with the contract if you want to, or you can rescind the contract. Rescind means to, to end the contract. Yeah? Batalkan contract. Though. So who can do that? The person who was coerced. Orang yang telah di, um, di ugut, ataupun who, the person who was threatened. That person is the one who has a choice. Because under section 65, it says that yeah, he can either proceed with the contract or rescind it. So that's why it's voidable. It will be void if you choose it to be void. So it can be void. Yeah? But if he rescinds it, yeah, if he says that he doesn't want to proceed with the contract, for example, Ali yeah, threatened Abu, asked him to sign a contract. If not, he will beat him up or whatever. Okay, so he signs the contract, but he's not doing it willingly. He was coerced. But later on, let's say, after signing the contract, now uh, Abu is no longer afraid, maybe because he has reported the matter to the police or yeah, he has already um, yeah, plucked up the courage and said that uh, I'm no longer afraid of him. Yeah, So he said, no, I'm not going to proceed with the contract. I want to rescind it. Yeah, I don't want to sell you my house. Yeah? What he has to do, however, is that he has to restore the benefits. Yeah, because under Section 65 says, yes, you can rescind the contract, but you've got to return whatever benefits that you have obtained through the contract because Ali may have paid money to Abu. All right? So if Ali has already paid money to Abu, then Abu would have to return the money to Ali. Then he can, then he can get um, um, the ownership of the property back. Yeah? So that is the effect of coercion. The contract is not void, it's voidable. You have a choice. The person who was coerced has a choice either to go on with the contract or to rescind it. Now, next um, thing that would cause a con consent not to be freely given is undue influence. Now, undue influence. Now, this is a very um, 
uh, some students find it very difficult yeah, to remember this term. And undue influence, what is influence? Basically, it is a form of um, pengaruh lah. Uh, influence to pengaruh lah. What kind of pengaruh? Undue. Undue basically means something that should not be there. Okay. So, what is undue influence? Now, this is defined under section 16. Section 16 says that to form undue influence, there has to be two things. What are the two things? One is that there must be a domination of will by one person over the other person. Domination of will. Domination means that you can control. Will, ah, bukan wasiat, eh? will tu maksudnya kehendak. Alright, so you can control ah, kehendak orang lain tu. Ah, so there must be a domination of will by one person over the other. But domination is not enough. There has to be unfair advantage. What is unfair advantage? Basically, you get something which is not fair. You shouldn't have gotten it in the first place. Yeah? Keuntungan yang tidak sepatutnya, yang tidak adil. Yeah? Obtain because of the domination of will. Disebabkan you boleh pengaruh orang tu, you dapat keuntungan yang tak sepatutnya ataupun yang tidak adil. Alright, so in what situations can you see that there is domination of will? Now, section 16 clause 2 says there are three types of relationships whereby you can presume. Ha, ingat, sini dia presume. Presume maksudnya kita anggap boleh kita boleh anggap yang ada domination of will. Tapi bila dalam presumption, macam juga intention, I'm sure you all have learned intention to create legal relation, ada presumption of law juga di situ. Now, presumption ni boleh disangkal. It can be rebutted. Alright, so but the law says, section 16 clause 2 says, you can presume, you boleh presume that there is domination of will dalam tiga keadaan ini. Firstly, where a person holds a real or apparent authority over Another person, real or apparent authority, which means that he has um, um, the authority over another person. Dia ada kuasa terhadap seseorang yang lain. Macam mana? Well, maybe in terms of um, the relationship of husband and wife, the husband has uh, a real author or apparent authority over the wife. Or between um, um, a parent and um, his or her um, uh, children. Yeah, children who have um, reached uh, the age of majority or who are still under the age of majority. Yeah, so you've got the real or apparent authority over, over the other. Right? Or in terms of employer and employee, for example, the employer asked the employee to sign a contract, yeah, although he did not force. Now, this is where you have to differentiate between coercion and undue influence because some students get confused between coercion and undue influence. Coercion, dia ada elemen paksaan, ugut. Tapi undue influence, dia tak ada. Dia tak ada ugut. Tapi cara dia, alright, because of the authority that they have, the domination of will, alright, so the other person rasa macam terdesak, terpaksa, terpaksa setuju. Okay, for example, the employer asks the employee, alright, um, I want you to sign this um, uh, what do you call it, uh, this agreement that you will not claim for uh, extra bonus. Uh, Alright, so um, maybe the employee, it feels like, oh, if he doesn't sign that he won't claim for extra bonus or extra overtime and all that, then he will not be uh, dismissed. Yeah, if, if he doesn't sign it, then he will be dismissed, he will be terminated. So even though the employer did not threaten him that, but because they are in a position whereby the employee is subjected to the employer's uh, authority. All right, so maybe yeah, he he feel that he is being dominated, his will is being dominated by the employer. All right, now second situation is where a person stands in a fiduciary relation to the other. What is fiduciary relation? Fiduciary relation basically is when one person has a relationship of trust over another person. And so let's say, for example, between a patient and his doctor. And so the patient tells a lot of things to the doctor, right? And the doctor, while um, attending to the client, and sometimes kan ada doctor suka borak-borak sambil, sambil uh, treat the client, the patient rather, and dia um, treat the patient, uh, dia borak-borak sambil tu. So, sambil-sambil borak tu mungkin the patient tells the doctor, oh, I've got this 
land that I want to sell or this uh, property that I want to sell. And then the doctor said, oh, okay, I'm also looking for a property that I want to buy. So how much are you going to um, to sell it? All right. So uh, maybe the patient feels yeah, that um, uh, terhutang budi ke pada doktor tu and terpaksa lah jual pada harga yang rendah and so on. So there's a relationship of trust, a fiduciary relationship which makes a person able to dominate the will of another person or a priest. Yeah, for example, a priest or uh, any form of um, um, spiritual um, leader, all right? Maybe that person uh, confess a lot of things, um, minta nasihat macam-macam daripada orang tu, benda-benda pribadi dicerita pada pada priest tu ataupun spiritual leader tu. Lepas tu, ah, they enter into a contract ya, dan dia rasa dominated by the will of um, that spiritual leader. Or even when you're doing, um, when a person is undergoing counselling sessions with another person, and that's when a lot of things come out. Ya. So, in that situation, when someone knows a lot of things about you, all right, then yeah, um, that person may be um, may be uh, dominated yeah, by the other, the other person. So these are relationships that you can presume that there is domination of will. Another situation is when a person enters into a contract with another person whose mental capacity is affected because of his age, because of his illness or mental or bodily distress. Now, don't get confused with a person who is insane, bukan eh? Remember, orang yang insane cannot enter into a contract because he does not have the capacity to enter into a contract. Here is where you're talking about a person whose mind will be affected because of his physical injury, perhaps. Because of his sickness. Dia boleh, dia waras. Tapi, because of his uh, illness, alright, he feels like he is um, dependent on another person. For example, let's say this person um has been um uh, katalah he, he is suffering from a disease or maybe he's suffering from a very critical illness all right so dia um sentiasa terbaring saja so dia perlukan the help of another person to um do um everyday chores for him so in the process uh, orang tu uh, suruh uh, ni uh, apa ni, memandangkan dah tak boleh bawa kereta ni, kereta ni tak nak jual ke? Ah, jual lah kat saya. Ah, saya nak beli kereta ni and you know, so that person oh, kan tak jual kereta kan, dia ni kan ah, tak nak datang lagi tolong dia. So that kind of um, situations whereby you can presume domination of will. Yeah? He is in a um, physically incapacitated uh, situation. He depends on another person. Alright, so he enters into a contract and remember, now not it is not just these three relationships there must also be unfair advantage so if you enter into a contract with um, anyone in these three situations tapi tak ada unfair advantage then there is no undue influence but if there there is unfair advantage and you are in a contract with any of these situations yeah, then you can presume there is domination of will and therefore there is undue influence okay now, so there are a number of cases on undue influence. Now, firstly, relationship to show domination of will, such as husband and wife, which I mentioned just now. Salwa Tanim against Haji Abdullah. This is a situation whereby the wife had initially, yeah, she was um, asked by the husband to transfer her property to his brothers. Yeah, so um, although she was not willing, but because of the husband having a real or apparent authority over her, so she agreed yeah, to transfer the property. But subsequently, she changed her mind and she did not want to proceed with the contract. And the court decided that, yes, there was undue influence because yeah, she was being dominated by the husband. Yeah? And there was, of course, unfair advantage. Second situation is Datuk Jaginder Singh against Tara Raja Ratnam. This is a case whereby it involves a lawyer. I remember between a lawyer and his client, there is fiduciary relationship. You see, fiduciary relationship, relationship of trust can arise in many situations. Doctor and the patient, the counsellor and the patient, um, lawyer and his client, right? A priest and his um yeah, his um, believers or yeah, his followers, all right, and so on. So um, here in this case, the lawyer asked the client to transfer certain property in his name. Now that is not something that lawyers will do, yeah. Um, but because the client was under 
uh, the impression that the lawyer knows best that he yeah because uh, he's handling the case and all that so that's why he um, 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 she agreed to to transfer the property right but subsequently um, the um, client realized that this was not uh, what is normally done and wanted to set aside the contract so there was undue influence and yeah? there was undue influence next is under section 16 clause 3 where the agreement is unconscionable unconscionable which means that it doesn't make sense at all tak masuk di akal yeah? if something it is unconscionable any reasonable person would not want to agree to it so which means that he is being dominated by the will of another person or that there is undue influence for example the case of chait singh against budin bin abdullah now what happened in this case was that the um uh, contract was regarding um a loan yeah which had um, interest up to 36 percent ah banyak tu tinggi tu 36 percent bank pun tak charge tinggi sangat macam tu so it is very unconscionable very unreasonable anyone in the right mind would want to enter into such contract yeah so there's unfair advantage here and yeah it is unconscionable therefore yeah the contract um, is avoidable because of undue influence yeah now what happens if you see when someone dominates the will of another person um it is not that that person cannot get advice from someone else. Let's say, for example, yeah, Ali. Yeah, let's say Ali is um, uh, a doctor and Abu is his patient. And Ali wanted Abu to sell uh, Abu's property to Ali. All right. But it's not that Abu must, you know, he's not being forced. Remember, it's not like coercion. He's not being forced to do it. He can get advice from other people. So if he has gotten advice from other people, yeah, then there is no undue influence. Yeah, if he has asked advice from someone else, let's say he goes to a um, real estate agent and asks, okay, property saya ni, doctor ni nak beli harga sekian-sekian. Is it reasonable? All right. So if the real estate agent says no, um, actually rendah sangat tu. Harga market value sekian-sekian. Uh, so then you boleh... Um, dia dah dapat uh, ad, um, advice ataupun dia pergi jumpa lawyer and dia dah dapat advice, alright, and dia tak nak teruskan. So, there is no undue influence because you are not being confined in a place and you know, forced to to sign the agreement but rather you have the ability to get advice. So, there is no undue influence in that situation. However, yang bagi advice tu mestilah tahu the whole facts of the situation. Yeah, he must be independent, dia tidak, dia tidak dia memihak kepada siapa-siapa and dia mestilah tahu all the facts. For example, in the case of Encik Noria against Syed Ali bin Omar. Now, in this case, now this lady wanted to transfer her property to her nephew sebab dia memang bergantung pada nephew dia banyak, nephew dia banyak tolong dia macam-macam. Yeah? So, um, she wanted to transfer the property, alright, but before that, she asked a lawyer. Yeah? She asked the lawyer whether she can do it. And yeah? she asked for legal advice. Yeah. Um, and the lawyer said it's okay, boleh. Uh, all right. However, uh, in that case, the lawyer did not know that the property that she wanted to give to the nephew was the whole property that she had. Remember, yeah, kita kalau kita nak bagi um apa ni? Um, uh, kita nak bagi property kepada seseorang, kita nak um, apa uh, hadanahkan uh, property kepada orang, kita tak boleh me, um, we cannot exclude ya yeah, our lawful beneficiaries kita tak boleh bagi seluruh property uh, kepada seorang waris sedangkan waris lain ada uh, so uh, the lawyer did, was not aware of that when he advised yeah, dia bagi dia bagi nasihat oh, boleh uh, tran, uh, boleh uh, transaction ni boleh transfer ni boleh dia tak tahu itu adalah segala-gala property yang this lady had. So, there was undue influence, yeah? Alright, so effect. Effect of undue influence is that the contract is voidable. Macam juga um, uh, coercion, yeah? the effect is that the contract is voidable. Uh, cuma section je berbeza. Kalau coercion tadi, section 19, undue influence is section 20, yeah? But the effect is the same. Section 65 says you have a choice. So, 
orang yang being dominated nah, The will dia being dominated tu Dia yang ada pilihan Bukan orang yang membuat domination of will tu And so he has a choice either to proceed with the contract Or to rescind it Again, if he rescinds it Whatever um, benefits that he has obtained Dia dapat duit ke untuk bayaran properti tu ke Ataupun apa-apa keuntungan yang dia dapat He has to return it to the other person Okay